Hi, welcome to our next segment. Um, in this video, we're going to be looking at three art movements, Art Nouveau, Fauvism, and Expressionism. So we are entering 20th century art, which is pretty exciting. Just to give you a bit of background information on, on Art Nouveau, this style flourished between 1890 and World War I, and it was an international ornamental style opposed to the sterility of the Industrial Age. Art Nouveau relied upon um, twining sort of flowery forms to counteract the unesthetic look of machine-made products. In Germany, it was called Jean de Stil, or youth style, and it was known by a bunch of other different names in other countries, but I'm not going to go through that. And um, this, is the, this is the time um, when you think of um, the, the novel The Great Gatsby. That was the movement that was happening um, during that um, during that novel. So the first artist that we're going to be studying is Gustav Klimt. Um, you have probably heard of him or at least seen his one of his most famous images which is the kiss which we will talk about later. Um, Gustav Klimt was Vienna's most renowned um, advocator of the Art Nouveau style. He was um, an Austrian painter and um, he is remembered as one of the greatest decorative painters of the 20th century. Um, he also produced one of the century's most significant bodies of erotic art. Um, initially successful as a conventional academic painter, um, his encounter with more modern trends in Europe, um, European art, encouraged him to develop his, to develop his own eclectic and often fan, um, fantastic um, style. Um, his position as the co-founder and first president of the Vienna Succession also ensured that this style would become widely influential. Influential, though Klimt's direct influence on other artists was limited, so um, he never really sought out um, controversy and scandal. But it did um, speckle his career, and although he never married, he is said to have fathered fourteen children. Um, this painting that you're looking at, which is Gustave um, Klimt's um, Daniel, 1907. Um, is really a typical representation of his sort of stylized eroticism and portrays the subject of Danye, which is a popular theme throughout painting and has been painted by um, Caraggio, Rembrandt, and Titian. And so there's a little smaller version of Titian's version um, that you can see on the right. Um, Danye was a symbol of a divine love, was a symbol of divine love, transcendence, and um, sensational beauty. By positioning the model with a raised leg, this painting does pay tribute to the Titian series of paintings that he did under the same name. As the story goes, while Danya was imprisoned by her father, she was visited by Zeus in the form of golden rain flowing between her legs. Soon after, Zeus visited um, Danya, became pregnant, and gave birth to her son Perseus. So here we see another example of art referencing art. We have these more modern artists looking back at, you know, old masters like um, Titian. Um, we saw Manet do the same thing as well. Um, so that's something important um, for you to keep in mind in terms of maybe comparing and contrasting um, art from different time periods. And here you can really see the, the sort of decorative um, patterning um, that he embraces. He used a lot of um, shapes um, and pattern. He also used a lot of gold leaf. Um, and, you know, people love his paintings. I love the way he depicts um, skin and the details. And he uses a lot of um, complementary colors like blue and orange. So, um, Klimt, you know, as I said before, claimed um, did um, do well as a conventional academic painter and received many commissions to paint public buildings. Um, he, later, he later abandoned both um, the realism um, and the approach to historical subject matter that was characteristic of the 19th century. However, his interest in the decorative possibilities of painting could be seen in, um, as a typical of the period's love and um, grandeur of elaboration. It might also be interpreted as an attempt to reconcile um, the nature and the artificial, a typical preoccupation of the 19th century as modern technology began to transform the world beyond recognition. Klimt became one of the founding members and president of um, the Vienna Succession in 1897 and of the group's um, periodical 
Ver Sacram, or Sacred Spring, this was a, a publication, he remained with the succession until 1908. The goals of the group were to provide exhibitions for unconventional young artists, to bring the works of the best foreign artists to the Vienna, and to, pub to publish its own magazine to showcase the work of, of its members. The group declared no manifesto and did not set out to encourage, encourage any particular style. Naturalists, realists, and symbolists all coexisted under this group. The government supported their effort and gave them a lease on a public land to um, erect an exhibition hall. The group symbol was um, Pallas Athena, the Greek goddess of just causes, wisdom, and the arts. In 1894, Klimt, Klimt was um, commissioned to create three paintings to decorate the ceiling of the Great Hall of the University of Vienna. Not complete until the turn of the century, his three paintings, Philosophy, Medicine, and Jurisprudence, um, and you're looking at um, medicine over here on the right, um, were criticized for their radical themes and material and were referred to as pornography. Klimt had transformed traditional allegory and symbolism into a new language that was more overtly sexual and hence more disturbing um, to, to some viewers. The public outcry came from all quarters, um, political, aesthetic, and religious. As a result, the painting, um, and you can see it to the right over here, the paintings were not displayed on the ceiling of the Great Hall. Um, this would be the last public commission accepted by the artist. All three paintings were destroyed by um, a retreating SS forces um, in May 1945, so this painting no longer exists. But again, you can really see the, the use of decorative, you know, very decorative in this sort of ornamental style. The image on the left is the Beethoven frieze. Um, this was a public commission um, that Klimt um, completed for the 14th Vienna Succession exhi Exhibition, and it was meant to celebrate um, the composer. And um, he had actually painted, it was meant to be a it was a frieze that he did on, along the wall, and so this is a detail of it. And it was actually painted directly on the wall with light materials. After the exhibition, the painting was preserved, although it did not go on display again until 1986. The Beethoven frieze now is on permanent display in the Vienna Succession Building, an especially built climate-controlled basement room. So I definitely think when you look at his work, you can see he definitely has a style, a very recognizable style, um, you know, with the eroticism of the figures as well as um, the patterning and sort of the decorative um, use of shapes and gold leaf and texture. While some of um, Klimt's contemporaries were vigorously opposed to decoration, Klimt was um, one of the period's most outstanding advocates for it. He strongly believed in the equality of fine and decorative arts, and some of his work shows his ambition to create a, um, and this is a German word, I'm going to mess it up, Giesskontwerk, oh, that was awful, awful. I'll spell it, um, G-E-S-A-M-T-K-U-N-S-T-W-E-R-K, -E which translates as a total work of art. And this was a union of the visual arts that might be created through ornament. Um, he was um, also closely associated with the Weiner Workstatt. Um, this was a design studio which worked to improve the quality of everyday objects. Klimt was one of the most influential advocates of Art Nouveau, um, this movement which spread through Europe in the late 19th century. Um, he approached, his approach was inspired um, by the ethereal atmosphere of works um, by artists such as Audrey Beardsley and by some aspects of Impressionist technique. It was also determinedly eclectic, borrowing motifs from Byzantine, Greek, and Egyptian art. And I think you can definitely um, really see that sort of decorative, um, sort of flat motif that, you know, we've, we've seen with some of those earlier ancient um, periods. So you can see that um, Gustav Klimt also did portraits, um, and of all the many women um, Klimt painted from his life, Adele Block Bauer, the wife of a Vienna banker and also apparently his lover, Klimt's lover, this is um, the one on the left, um, the, gold, the more gold one, is um, the first of two portraits. Um, it's considered to be many, 
by many to be his finest work. Um, the sitter is adorned with precious materials and ancient artifacts, suggesting her wealth and power, but her stare and her grasping hands also suggest that she is fragile. Despite these features, Klimt was largely unconcerned at the time with depicting his sitter's character, and even less so with providing um, location and context. So, you know, this idea of of what you know the setting you know here it's just more of this sort of undescript kind of flat decorative background um, and so um, you know it, it really is a different approach I think um, to portraits that um, we haven't seen before so the kiss is perhaps Klimt's most popular and um, renowned celebration um, and one of one about sexual love um, and eroticism in the kiss, the woman is being absorbed by the man, while both figures are engulfed by the body of gold in which they lie. The background suggests a night sky, while the bodies um, teeter at the edge of a flowering meadow at the, at the bottom of the composition, um, as if they are in danger of cascading into the darkness. Um, much like the Adele um, Block Bauer portrait and other paintings um, similar to it, um, there's this representational forms that barely emerge um, from a highly ornate but ultimately abstract form. And so you have these smaller sort of shapes and forms and they kind of create these like larger, I think more sort of geometric forms as well. And, um, and it really is, it's this, it's this weird mixture of um, something that's representational because we do recognize the figures, we do recognize them as a man and woman, but they also sort of um, morph into this um, abstract um, pattern background. Um, a biographer named um, Frank Whitford has pointed out that the earlier studies of this picture show the man with a beard, um, suggesting that he might be meant to represent the artist himself, so perhaps his self-portrait, while the woman represents Block Bauer, um, the the Vienna, the wife of the Vienna banker. Um, the kiss is considered the masterpiece of the artist's golden period, and I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Where he did really incorporate this use of gold filigree um, in his compositions, and you know where the sort of decorative um, motif is is in, is very elaborate. Um, Klimt used. Um, the idea of gold um, and as well as the, the, the sort of symbolic shapes or these sort of um, geometric shapes for symbolic purposes um, with this idea that rectangular forms evoke masculinity while circular forms evoke the feminine. Um, and so you can definitely see that, you know, in the, in the part of the shroud of the woman, you see these very um, tiny sort of circular patterns and with the man you see these very rectilinear forms and squares and um, rectangles. So Klimt's exploration of human relationships in his work was considered very modern at the time. Um, he believed that no institution or person had the right or um, of censorship over his work. He, his work is a synthesis of both decorative and this sort of sumptuous um, style of Art Nouveau and symbolism. The use of gold leaf and silver leaf um, is not incidental. Um, Klimt's father was a gold engraver by trade, and so we can see that influence, I think, um, in his decorative style. Um, Klimt had also learned um, the techniques of mosaic, fresco, and oil painting. Um, this influence is seen in the carpet of flowers. I think this sort of mosaic or sort of tile um, sort of like effect, you know, very reminiscent of some of the ancient Greek um, and uh, uh, um, Roman works that we looked at. Um, the gold is very much like the mosaic found in Byzantine churches, um, so we definitely see that reference as well. And Klimt was very much influenced by the Italian mosaics that we, he saw in Ravenna. And so remember, we, we looked at the... Um, mosaics of Justinian and Theodora um, from that period in the church um, in Ravenna. So that might be something to, to go back and, and look at as well. So here is one of those mosaics of Justinian and his entourage that we saw at um, San Vitale in Ravenna when we were looking at um, Byzantine art. 
Um, so just to review um, the composition, let me look closely. So you can here's a detail where you can um, definitely see the the decorative um, patterning. Um, the couple each wear individual highly decorated gowns. The difference in their gown is important. Again, um, the man's gown is more geomet geometric and rectilinear, consisting of black and white um, masculine shapes. By contrast, the woman's flowery um, um, sort of gown um, sort of ties her visually to this carpet of flowers as well. You can kind of see how she sort of melds into it, where he's more separate. And some historians think that this is a reference to sort of tying her and linking her um, to Mother Nature. Um, and her gown also does have geometric patterns, um, but more circular. Um, again, we, we talked about the golden um, background that sort of envelops them, and this is supposed to be this idea of this sort of sexual union. Um, and so Clint, a lot of Clint's works explore themes of birth, life, and death, um, which is a common theme that we've seen um, with some earlier artists. We saw that with Pope Paul Gauguin, um, and uh, we saw that uh, with, um, oh my god, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't think right now. Um, sorry, Edward Monk, <laughs> um, in his, in, in his, um, the screen. So again, you know, we really do see artists exploring, um, you know, moving away from these sort of religious and historical paintings, but really focusing on, you know, these relationships, um, of love and, and sex and, and fear of dying, um, and, and really just, you know, exploring these ideas of human nature and human fears, I think. Just to show you how well loved this painting is, in 2003, um, it was commemorated by the Austrian state. It was part of a special collector's um, Austrian coin depicting Klimt in his studio, which is on the other side, and the kiss at the back side of the coin. This coin is an example of how people saw the beauty in Gustav Klimt's artwork. Artwork, he was able to touch the hearts of people all, all over the world. And I think that's something else that's important that. Um, this painting has really stood the test of time, um, and even though people might have looked at it as being very controversial, um, it really, you know, has this modern sensibility that, you know, still today we, we relate to it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this, this painting that he did, um, and other paintings like it, gave other artists the inspiration to bring more emotion to their pieces, and also inspire people to fall in love with this idea of falling in love. And, and so again, you, know, you have to think about the early 19th century and, and you know, sex was such a taboo subject and courting and relationships that you know, this notion of love and being in love um, was, was something new as well and in being investigated in art. So I'm going to show you a clip from one of my favorite shows, um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, that features a um, Klimt um, the Kiss poster as well as a Monet um, uh, poster as well. It's kind of funny. So I hope you watch it. Okay, so I'm going to end here. Um, um, in the next segment, we're going to be looking at Fauvism and the work of um, Henri Matisse. So stay tuned. I should probably have that video up um, later this afternoon on Saturday. So stay tuned. <laughs>